Thank you, Dr. Baum, for your kind introduction. Dean Spiegel, board members, alumni, faculty and students, class of 2020, family and friends. I'm honored to give the keynote address today at the White Coat Ceremony of the class of 2020. This ceremony has a special personal significance to me since my son Nir will be receiving his white coat as a new medical student exactly a year from now. Members of the class of 2020, first and foremost, congratulations. Each one of you worked very hard to reach this important milestone in your lives. Some of you decided to become physicians at a very young age, while others made the decision later in life. But you all share a common goal, to dedicate your lives to healing people, to exploring and finding new treatments and cures, and to be strong advocates for our patients. I assume that now you may be confused and are asking yourselves, what does it mean to put on a white coat? By donning the white coat, you're becoming members of the medical team. However, wearing the white coat has a deeper meaning than simply being the universal medical uniform. When you're putting on the white coat, you're making a very special and deep personal commitment as you join the medical community. Indeed, medicine is not only a profession, it is a calling, a mission, and a commitment, total commitment to our patients, to our community, and to our society. As physicians, you will have two obligations, a professional obligation and a moral obligation. And to fulfill these two commitments, you will be required to make sacrifices, putting your patient's health and best interests above your own interests and your family's priorities and interests. Remember, the practice of medicine carries with it a huge responsibility and requires sacrifices, but it is also the most rewarding, inspiring, and selfless profession, and you should be proud, very proud, for joining the community of medical professionals. In the coming years, you will learn the science and art of medicine from your professors, from your mentors, and from your own fellow students. But your most important teachers are going to be your patients. I believe that medicine is best taught by individual patient stories, and today I will share with you three of my patient stories that carry, carry with them important messages, especially for you as you enter the medical field. My first story is very relevant for today's occasion because it is the story of the first patient I ever took care of when I was a medical student at Sackler School of Medicine in Tel Aviv, Israel. This patient, whom I shall refer to as David, was a 70-year-old Holocaust survivor that was admitted with a stroke. The right side of his body was completely paralyzed. During David's prolonged stay in the hospital, I used to meet with him every day and as our connection grew, I learned his life story. His entire family perished in the Holocaust and he was the only survivor. His wife, whom he met when he came to Israel, was also a Holocaust survivor with no remaining relatives. They married and had an only son. About 10 years before I met David, his only son was killed in the Yom Kippur 1973 war and about two years before I met David, his wife died of cancer. David was alone in the world with half his body paralyzed, lying in bed, being encouraged by the physical therapist to try to move his right arm and leg. One day, after about two weeks of daily meetings with David, I found him sitting in his chair very excited. Look, Yaron, he told me, I can walk. And he pushed himself with both arms, stood up, walked a few steps, and went back to his chair to rest. Isn't it wonderful? He said, all excited. Yes, it is, I replied. After I left David's room, I couldn't stop thinking about him. I was amazed how after being hit by so many tragedies in his life, David still had the willpower and motivation to overcome his condition and push himself to walk another step. At that moment, I realized that David had taught me the most important lesson I learned in medical school. Never let your patients lose hope. With so many tragedies striking him, David's situation may have seemed hopeless. He lost his entire family, and now he lost movement in half his body. But David refused to give up. 
He may have hoped to walk his favorite street again, or to go to the coffee shop he and his wife used to frequent, or walk to temple on Saturdays to pray for the memory of his wife and fallen son. There were many things that he could have hoped for that motivated him to go through the grueling physical therapy to be able to walk again. But he never lost hope. As physicians, you will encounter many patients with conditions that require hope and motivation, and you will need to instill hope in your patients. Even when your patients will have conditions with no cure or remedy, you can never let your patients lose hope. I am not talking about false hopes for a cure you know is impossible and unattainable. I'm talking about giving your patients hope about life itself. Hope that no matter how fragile, sick, and debilitated they are, your patients' lives are precious. Precious to you as their lives are precious to them and their families. And you will do whatever you can to help them cope with their condition and alleviate their sufferings. Instilling hope is one of the most important commitments of a true healer. And this commitment has not changed over the years. Indeed, the goals and commitments of the medical profession are the same as they were 3,000 years ago. However, some aspects of medicine are changing, and I would like to address today the changes and rapid progress happening in medicine and healthcare and how they will affect you when you graduate. Scientific breakthroughs enable us today to cure diseases that had no treatment until just recently. In the past century alone, life expectancy in the U.S. increased by 30 years due to progress in public health and new therapeutic modalities. And social progress is bringing us closer to a universal health coverage that will ensure complete equity in the utilization of medical resources to benefit all our patients. The scientific and technological changes are also affecting our patients. Indeed, our patients are changing. Mostly their expectation from us are much higher than in the past. Patients today are very savvy in obtaining information. They surf the web, they go online, they gather information about their conditions, as well as about their physicians and hospitals quality metrics. And as a result, they make much more informed decisions than in the past. Therefore, the physician of the 21st century is practicing medicine in a very different environment than in the past taking care of much more informed, sometimes much more misinformed patients, assuming additional responsibilities in caring for communities and managing population health, and tackling much more complex moral dilemmas created by the rapid advances in science. So how will the changing landscape of the medical profession affect you when you graduate? You will need to acquire new skill sets to practice medicine. The fund of knowledge you need to possess in order to practice medicine according to the latest scientific and clinical discoveries is way beyond the capacity of human memory. Therefore, you will need to become lifelong learners. The most important skill you will acquire in medical school is how to learn, how to expand your knowledge, and how to analyze, evaluate, and apply the vast amount of scientific data available to you into your day-to-day -day practice. However, you will not only learn from books, lectures, manuscripts, and online resources. Your most valuable resource for learning is your patients. And to learn from your patients, you will need to listen to them. In our fast-paced world, many people feel they don't have enough time to listen to a human story. But in no other profession is listening more important than in medicine. Your patients will teach you more than any textbook or manuscript. And if you listen to them, they will make you better physicians. Even after more than 30 years of practicing medicine, my patients still teach me when I'm in the clinic or rounding in the hospital. Let me tell you another story of a patient to illustrate the importance of listening and learning from your patients. About 15 years ago, I saw a patient that I will call Rose. Rose had thyroid cancer. She had surgery and radiation and was doing well. Her follow-up required a once-a-year blood test to check that her cancer did not recur. After many years of being cancer-free, in one of her yearly testing, the blood test came back positive, indicating cancer recurrence. I broke the bad news to Rose and made preparations to treat her. As we often do, a few days before she was scheduled for, uh, for treatment, I repeated the blood test, and to my surprise and delight, the test came back negative. We therefore canceled the treatment after repeating the test one more time just to make sure 
that indeed the test was negative. The obvious conclusion was that the first test showing cancer recurrence was probably a lab error. However, a year later, we tested rows for thyroid cancer recurrence, and the exact same thing happened. The first blood test came back positive, and the repeat blood test was negative. I later confirmed that the first positive test was indeed an error. This was very surprising, but I assumed that this is just a rare coincidence that two years in a row we had a lab error. But when I discussed this with Rose, reassuring her that her cancer is still in remission, she asked, Doctor, could the positive result in the first blood test be because of the flu shot? In the past two years, I happened to take the flu shot one week before you did the blood test that came back falsely positive, and I feel that the flu shot made the blood test turn positive. While I knew from the literature that no such association between the flu shot and this thyroid cancer blood test becoming falsely positive had ever been reported, I was intrigued by Rose's suggestion. And indeed, further investigation confirmed that Rose was right. She had a rare antibody in her blood called heterophil antibody that can interfere with the cancer test and cause it to be falsely positive. We concluded that her flu shot boosted her immune system and caused the interfering heterophil antibodies to go up and interfere with the blood test. So not, not only did Rose figure out something that has never been reported in the medical literature, but she also helped us change the way we tested her for thyroid cancer rec recurrence. The lesson from this story is simple. Always listen to your patients and you will make better decisions to help them. As I mentioned earlier, the information ch uh, age makes our patients savvier about their conditions. We all know that they constantly consult with that famous physician called Dr. Google, and therefore communicating with our patients requires a new approach. So how should you communicate your knowledge and recommendations to your patients in this new environment? Let me tell you what I found very effective. When communicating with my patients, I aim to empower them to take charge of their disease and not simply to articulate to them my diagnosis and recommendations. Indeed, your patients are the most important stakeholders for the success of their treatment, and empowering them to take charge of their condition is the best way to ensure success. Empowering your patients, turning them into your partners in conquering the disease, requires leadership, motivational skills, and endless amounts of compassion. But if you succeed in empowering your patients to take charge of their disease, you and your patient together will achieve unimaginable results. So how do you empower your patients to take charge of their disease? Another personal story is best to illustrate this point. As a fellow training in endocrinology, I saw a patient that I would call Joanne. Joanne underwent resection of a pituitary tumor. This is a benign tumor that grows just below the brain. Surgery went well, and Joanne was scheduled to go home. One of the rare complications after pituitary surgery is hyponatremia or low blood sod sodium levels. And while rare, it can be life-threatening. There is no, to, no way to predict who will develop hyponatremia and no way to prevent it. Therefore, I made it a habit not to simply give my patients the standard handout describing this complication, but after every pituitary surgery, I spend as much time as needed with every patient to make sure the patient knows how to recognize the early warning signs of hyponatremia and what to do if the symptoms appear. I sat with Joanne before her discharge home and explained at length what is hyponatremia, why it develops, how to recognize the early warning signs, and what to do if they develop. To make, to make things even more challenging, Joanne did not speak English, and this entire conversation was done with the help of a translator. But I made sure that when Joanne went home, she was empowered to understand this rare but important risk and knew what to do if the symptoms appear. By the time I was done, she probably knew about hyponatremia more than some healthcare professionals. Sure enough, two days later, she called us early in the morning saying that she thinks she has the early symptoms of hyponatremia, and Joanne was right. She was admitted that morning with severe hyponatremia, treated and sent home a few days later with no complications. A simple bedside discussion empowering her to understand and take charge of her condition may, has, may have saved her from a life-threatening complication. So how do you empower your patients to take charge of their condition? 
Listen to them carefully as Rose's story demonstrated. Give them accurate and detailed information about their disease and be as transparent as possible as Joanne's story illustrated. And most importantly, give your patients hope as David taught me. The key to empowering your patients is to make them your partners in shared decision making regarding their conditions. As an example, just a few days ago, Medicare announced that a new cardiac device called Watchman, this is a device that's implanted inside the heart to prevent blood clots. So this device, Watchman, will not be covered by Medicare unless there was documented shared decision-making process between the patient and the physician regarding this procedure and only after the patient consulted with an independent cardiologist. One of the most profound changes happening in healthcare nowadays is that the spectrum of responsibilities we have as physicians has greatly increased. Today we're expected to do much more than take care of our patients when they show up at our clinic or at the emergency department. In the past, practicing medicine was somewhat like working in a car mechanic shop. When something was broken or was not working properly, you went to the doctor or were admitted to the hospital, treated and sent back home until something else broke down similar to a car mechanic. Today, our job as physician does not end when the patient leaves the hospital. Our job only begins when the patient leaves the hospital. Before your patient goes home, you should ask yourselves, is my patient going home to a place where he or she can safely take care of himself or herself? Will my patient be able to afford the medications I prescribed for him or her? Will she or he be able to afford healthy food? Is the neighborhood where my patient lives in safe? Does my patient need aid at home? These questions and some more go into the heart of what it means to be healthy. The World Health Organization, the WHO, defines health as follows. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. Let me repeat it again. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. Remember, as physicians, we're expected not only to treat the medical conditions that afflict our patients, but we also have to take care of our patients' social and mental well-being. The Montefiore Einstein Health System is unique among hospitals in the US in that it is one of the first to have a specific training track in social medicine. Residents in that track learn to take care of disadvantaged patients in underserved neighborhoods and engage our community to improve the health of the entire population and not only the individual patient. Establishing this track at Montefiore more than 40 years ago was visionary. And nowadays, healthcare reform is requiring all hospitals to adopt the Montefiore-Einstein approach to community and population health. Diabetes is a good example. Here at Einstein and Montefiore, treating individual patients with diabetes, tailoring medications and diet and exercise for them is only the first step. We also engage our community to help bring healthy food to our community and develop community teaching programs and activism to prevent and or treat diabetes. I believe that the hospitals of the future are those that are dedicated to serve their communities and not simply operate as high-tech tertiary care centers. And you should be proud that you will train in the best hospital of the future right here at Einstein and Montefiore. Indeed, Einstein and Montefiore's outstanding unique bond to the Bronx community is for me one of their main attractions. And the success of Einstein and Montefiore's efforts to serve the Bronx community is very noticeable. I'm consistently struck by the high regard in which the people of the Bronx hold Einstein and Montefiore. A few years ago, the US News and World Report magazine featured Montefiore's groundbreaking programs to improve the health of the Bronx community. The US News article said, and I quote, Montefiore is pioneering a new model of healthcare delivery endorsed by the architects of health reform that promises to radically change the current fragmented system, end quote. The US News article illustrates perfectly our mission here at Einstein and Montefiore to practice holistic form of medicine, combining the care for the individual health with the care of the health of the community. This new approach to healthcare delivery requires both teamwork and leadership. 
And as physicians practicing in the 21st century, you will become leaders. Leaders of diverse clinical teams working together to improve your patient's health. Leaders of diverse research teams working together to find new cures for diseases. And leaders of diverse social medicine teams working with our communities to improve our population health. Before concluding, I want to say a few words to the parents, siblings, spouses, and other family members and friends of our students. The success of, our, of the students sitting here today would not be possible without the unlimited support you have been giving them. First, as you well know, is the financial support, the endless financial support that you have been giving your students. But much more important is the emotional and social support that you provide to our students. This love and support are vital for their continued success. Class of 2020, you are the future leaders of our profession. You are the future fighters for social justice and you will definitely make the world a better place. Class of 2020, you're beginning a beautiful journey of intensive learning, hard work, self-exploration and discovery. You're joining the ranks of the most noble profession. Congratulations and thank you. <laughs>